Hi, everybody. I'm Brittany Lewis with Forbes Breaking News. Joining me now is my Forbes colleague, Kyle Mullins. Kyle, thanks so much for joining me. Always great to be here, Brittany. As part of the Money in Politics team here at Forbes, you have found the net worth of House Speaker Mike Johnson. But before we get into his finances of today, can you walk us down memory lane and talk about his career and how he made his money until he was elected to the House? Absolutely, Brittany. So Mike Johnson uh, was born in 1972, Shreveport, Louisiana. It's a mid-sized city near the Texas border. Uh, Johnson was you know, working class family. Um, he went to college and law school in Louisiana uh, and started a career as a public interest lawyer. I think we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But, um, you know, public interest lawyer for a long time. He did a brief stint as the dean of a private uh, law school that was a private Christian law school that was uh, trying to start up in Louisiana. Um, it didn't actually end up going anywhere. He resigned after two years uh, and the law school never actually ended up opening due to issues with the sort of parent school that it worked with. Um, and uh, after that, again, continued to work in law. He did less than a single term in the Louisiana uh, State House of Representatives and then was elected to Congress. And in your piece for Forbes, you note that he built his legal career by focusing on religious liberty issues. Can you touch on that for us? Yeah, absolutely. Religious liberty issues is kind of a broad umbrella term uh, that, I'm, that I'm using there. I mean, that's how he markets uh, his, his, his legal career. Um, but he was a, a lawyer and a spokesperson for the uh, Alliance Defense Fund. Um, now known as the Alliance Defending Freedom, but so the, the ADF. Um, this is an organization that he worked at for much of his career, in the, especially in the in the 2000s. Um, and they're an organization that uh, defends uh, what they say defends people of faith, um, often from government. Uh, you know, they uh, some cases that you might think of that they have they have uh, taken up involve you know uh, Christian schools or uh, other religious organizations getting funding from the government for various things. They might've otherwise been denied because they were religious organizations. Um, they've also taken some pretty controversial stances on social issues that I think puts Johnson and the ADF kind of out of sync with a lot of, uh, sort of mainstream public opinion in the United States. Um, in particular, um, and, and especially modern day public opinion, uh, you know, going back to early in his career, um, he was very active in helping the ADF, uh, fight against the legalization of same-sex marriage um, and even supporting laws that would have criminalized homosexual sexual acts. Um, he wrote in a 2004 op-ed, I, I, I want to pull the quote so I get it right, um, but he wrote in a 2004 op-ed in a Louisiana newspaper, uh, he warned of chaos, quote, chaos and sexual anarchy, including people marrying their pets, if same-sex marriage were to become legal in the state of Louisiana. So, like I said, um, I think this is all notable and interesting because it really gives a little of insight into the background of the guy who is now second in line for the presidency. And, um, you know, th th these kinds of views may be informing public policy. Really interesting. Thanks for your reporting there. But let's talk about the money component here. How did his salaries from his legal career compare to when he beca began working in government? So Mike Johnson wasn't doing sort of complex international mergers and acquisitions or, uh, or, or, you know, intellectual property law or one of these things that makes you lots and lots of money. Um, Mike Johnson was doing public interest law, which notoriously does not pay as well as some of these other big areas of, of law. Um, his salaries, uh, you know, right before he entered office were actually pretty comparable to what he made as a legislator. Um, now, his house salary, $174,000, that is certainly nothing to sneeze at. Um, and he was making roughly that much as a lawyer right beforehand. Um, but we're not talking about sort of the enormous millions of dollars that you might have seen in the you know, private practice, uh, say, for some of the justices on the Supreme Court, um, which I've also done reporting on. So, um, you know, we're talking about fairly comparable amounts here. If you and I were having this conversation a year ago, I bet most people would say, who? Once we said Congressman Mike Johnson, he wasn't well known until former House Speaker Kevin McCarthy's ouster in the fall. Can you talk about how Mike Johnson became Speaker? So Kevin McCarthy, yeah, former Speaker Kevin McCarthy uh, now and former Congressman Kevin McCarthy right now, notably, uh, he was Speaker of the House uh, after Republicans retook the House by a very narrow majority in the 2022 midterms. Um, he got elected after a long protracted speaker fight um, in which the sort of far right wing of his caucus was trying to extract concessions from him on, on how he was going to run the House. Um, 
they uh, there was a, there was a bit of a revolt led by Matt Gates, a uh, Republican from Florida. Um, he and a couple of others uh, on, in, the, in the Republican caucus managed to, again, with the, with the help of Democrats who were never going to vote for Kevin McCarthy as speaker, managed to actually oust him as, uh, as speaker. And they did that, um, they said, because he had worked with Democrats to pass spending bills in a way that he had told them he would not. Um, so that he'd, he'd lost the trust of some of these members. Um, and, you know, when you have an extremely narrow majority, you need the trust of every member you have. So after Kevin McCarthy was ousted, uh, you had this sort of saga of speaker sh after speaker after speaker candidate um, being put up and then rejected by the House of Representatives over and over and over. Um, and the GOP didn't seem like they were going to be able to consolidate on things. It took several weeks. Eventually, they landed on uh, Mike Johnson. He's kind of a backbencher. He was only really known before this for um, leading efforts to overturn the 2020 election, uh, le leading those legal efforts to do so. Um, so very pro-Trump guy here. But uh, you know he was he was not a, a particularly prominent figure in the House of Representatives, um, and then he became the Speaker of the House. And earlier this month, we saw a tamped down effort, uh, revolt rather. Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene did file a motion to oust him as Speaker. Is there any indication that he could give up the gavel? Yeah, so a bit of context here. Um, this is coming after Mike Johnson did the exact thing that got his predecessor, Kevin McCarthy, ousted, which is he worked with Democrats to pass spending bills. Um, that is kind of a no-go when it comes to some of the more, uh, the furthest right members of the Republican caucus. With that said, Green um, has filed this motion to vacate the chair uh, and, and, and oust uh, Johnson as speaker, but she hasn't actually taken the steps necessary to move that to a vote. So we're not sure if we're actually going to see a vote there. It's kind of just hanging there like a sword of Damocles over uh, over Mike Johnson's head, just waiting, you know, maybe any day she might take that motion and push it to a vote. Um, but there's also a lot of talk in Capitol Hill right now that if she actually did end up doing so, um, a lot of legislators really don't want to have another weeks long dragged out speaker fight. Um, and there might even be some Democrats that uh, vote to back Johnson in exchange for some concessions about how he's running the House. Um, and if they do that, uh, you might be looking at a, a sort of an odd coalition government between more moderate Republicans and more moderate Democrats. It would be pretty unprecedented in, in, in American history. Really interesting move because that certainly didn't happen for former Speaker Kevin McCarthy. But let's turn now to Johnson's finances. How much is he worth? We're estimating that Speaker Johnson is worth about $350,000. Um, that's a much smaller number than a lot of the numbers that, uh, you know, I'm typically reporting on on these politicians. Um, and that's really the big takeaway here, I think, is he is the least wealthy House Speaker of this century. Um, everyone from Nancy Pelosi, who's the only Democratic Speaker of this century, to uh, John Boehner, Paul Ryan, Kevin McCarthy, uh, and Dennis Hastert, all Republicans, all of them have been worth significantly more than, um, uh, than, than Speaker Johnson. Does he come from a wealthy family? No. Um, his father was an assistant fire uh, chief in Shreveport, Louisiana, um, and was actually injured really badly in a fire accident in uh, when, when Johnson was only 12. Um, so he was on disability for a long time, and um, he, he doesn't come from money is the short answer here. Um, he, he lived a pretty working class uh, upbringing. He's the least wealthy speaker in a century, but can you break down his assets for us? What makes up his smaller fortune? So of that $350,000, you've got his home, which is about $300,000 of that. Um, the home is worth $600,000. It's got about $300,000 of debt on it. This is all; These are all uh, Forbes' estimates. Um, aside from that, he's got some retirement assets uh, and he's got some additional debt. That brings it up to about three fifty, dollars um, And that's, that's it. That's the total totality of his finances. I will note that he has said in the past he does have a checking account but he chooses not to disclose it. Unlike most members of Congress, he chooses not to disclose it on his uh, on his financial disclosure. Um, you're not technically required to if the account doesn't bear interest. So he's not, you know, he's he's within the law here and everything. Um, but most most members of Congress do tend to uh, declare their checking accounts. So it's a little bit odd that he doesn't. So we actually he he could have this big stash of cash in an interest free checking account, and we just don't know. That seems unlikely, um, you know, but but it, it, you know, it's certainly possible. Um, it, it, he strikes me as somebody who is, for the most part, uh, living closer to paycheck to paycheck than uh, than the average, um, you know, Speaker of the House in recent years. We do know that he's been married for a couple decades now. Does his wife contribute to the uh, to his fortune at all? 
Not really, no. Um, his wife, uh, for the most part, has not been uh, a major contributor to the fortune. Um, she did, after he became a member of Congress, she did found a Christian consulting, or excuse me, a uh, Christian counseling firm um, that provides sort of religious-based counseling to people. Uh, and she made as much as $50,000 a year from that uh, at, for, in various years since he uh, joined the House of Representatives. So, you know, she, she has been contributing, you know, some income to the household, but it hasn't been, a, a, you know, an enormous amount of money. And you're reporting that on the horizon, he could be facing an upcoming potential financial setback. What does that look like? This is something that I think a lot of Americans might relate to, um, especially Americans older than you and me. Um, you know, he's got four kids and they're getting to be college age pretty soon. So, uh, you know, he's going to have to send them to college. College is not a cheap prospect in this country, as we as we know. Um, and so depending on where they end up going, uh, you know, he's he's going to have to be um, either either his kids are going to be taking on debt or, you know, he's going to be helping them pay for that. Um, again, I, I think it just underscores he doesn't have a lot of savings that he's going to be able to dip into in order to, to, to back up a financial venture like that. Kyle, you noted throughout our conversation here that he is the least wealthy of all speakers in the past century. Why is that? To put it really simply, uh, Speaker Johnson didn't have a particularly lucrative pre-Congress career, uh, unlike some of his uh, you know, colleagues um, or, or predecessors as, as speaker. Um, he also didn't marry rich. Um, Nancy Pelosi's husband, for example, is a venture capital guy. Uh, you know, she, she has... Uh, a very, very lengthy financial disclosure, and essentially all of it is her husband's assets, uh, just, to, just to pick one example there. Um, so he hasn't come from money, he hasn't made an enormous amount of money, and he didn't marry into money. Uh, that kind of sums it up. Kyle Mullins, per usual, thank you so much for your reporting. I look forward to chatting with you again soon. Always happy to be here, Brittany.